fern seed and elephants. This paper arose out of a um, conversation I had with the principal one night last summer. A book of Alec Vidler's happened to be lying on the table and expressed my reaction to the sort of theology it contained. My reaction was a hasty and ignorant one, produced with the freedom that comes after dinner. One thing led to another, and before we were done, I was saying a good deal more than I had meant about the type of thought which, so far as I could gather, is now dominant in many theological colleges. He then said, I wish you would come and say all this to my young men. He knew, of course, that I was extremely ignorant of the whole thing. But I think his idea was that you ought to know how a certain sort of theology strikes the outsider. Though I may have nothing but misunderstandings to lay before you, you ought to know that such misunderstandings exist. That sort of thing is easy to overlook inside one's own circle. The minds you daily meet have been conditioned by the same studies and prevalent opinions as your own. That may mislead you, for of course, as priests, it is the outsiders you will have to cope with. You exist in the long run for no other purpose. The proper study of shepherds is sheep, not save, not save accidentally other shepherds. And woe to you if you do not evangelize. I am not trying to teach my grand grandmother. I am a sheep telling shepherds what only a sheep can tell them. And now I start my belating. There are two sorts of outsiders, the uneducated and those who are educated in some way, but not in your way. How you, how, how you are to deal with the first class if you hold views like Lucy's or Sch Schwitzer's or Baltman's or Telich's or even Alec Wittler's, I simply don't know. I see, and I'm told that you see, that it would be it would hardly do to tell them what you really believe. A theology which denies the histor historicity, historicity of nearly everything in the Gospels to which Christian life and affections and thought have been fastened for nearly two millennia, which either denies the miraculous together or more strangely, after swallowing the camel of the resurrection strains at such gnats as the feeding of the multitudes if offered to the uneducated man can produce only one one or other of two effects it will make him a roman catholic or an atheist what you offer him he will not recognize as christianity if he holds to what he calls christianity he will leave a church in which he is no longer taught and look for one where it is if he agrees with your ver version he will no longer call himself a christian and no longer come to church in his crude course way he would respect you much more if you did the same an experienced clergyman told me that what that most liberal priests faced with this problem have recalled from its grave the late medieval conception of two truth, a picture truth which can be preached to the people, and an esoteric truth for use among the clergy. I shouldn't, I shouldn't think you will enjoy this conception, which when you have to put it into practice, I'm sure if I had to produce um, picture truth to a pair, pair, parishioner in great anguish 
or understand fierce temptation and produce them with this seriousness and fervor which his condition demanded, while knowing all the time that I didn't exactly, only in some Pickwickian sense, believe him myself. I'd find my forehead getting red and damp and my collar getting tight. But that is your headache, not mine. You have all, you have, after all, a different sort of collar. I claim to belong to the second group of outsider, educated, but not theoretically, theologically educated. How one member of that group feels, I must now tell to tell, I must now try to tell you. The undermining of the old orthodoxy has been mainly the work of divines engaged in New Testament criticism. The authority of experts in this discipline is the authority in difference to whom we are asked to give up a huge mass of beliefs shared in common by the early church, the fathers, the Middle Ages, the reformers, and even the 19th century. I want to explain what it is that makes me skeptical about this authority. Ignorantly skeptical, as you will all too easily see. But the skepticism is the fa father of the ignorance. It is hard to perceive in a close setting, a close study, when you can work up no prima facie confidence in your teacher teachers. First, then, whatever these men may be as biblical critics, I distrust them as critics. They seem to me to lack uh, literary literary judgment, to be in, imperceptive about the very quality of the text they are reading. It sounds a strange charge to bring against men who have been steeped in those books all their lives but that might be just the trouble a man who has spent his youth and manhood in the minute study of the new testament texts and of other pe other people's study of them whose literary experience of those texts lacks any standard of com uh, comparison such as can only grow from a wide and deep and genuine experience of literature in general is, I should think, very likely to miss the obvious things about them. If he tells me that something is a gospel in legend or romance, I want to know how many legends or romances he has read, how well his palate is trained in detecting them by the flavor, not how many years he has spent on that gospel. But I had better turn to examples. In what is already a very old com commentary, I read that the fourth gospel is regarded by one school as a spiritual romance, a poem, not a history, or to uh, poem, not a history, to be judged by the same canons as Nathan's parable, the book of Joah, Paradise Lost, or more exactly, Pilgrim's Progress. After a man has said that, why need one attend to anything else he says about any book in the world note that it regards pilgrim's progress a story which professes to be a dream and flaunts its allegorical nature by every single proper name it uses as the closest parallel note that the whole epic uh, pan panoply of Milton goes for nothing. But even if we leave out the grosser absurdities and keep to Joa, the insensitiveness is crass. Joa is a tale with as few even pretended historical attachments as Job, grotesque in incidents and surely not without a distinct, though of course edifying vein of typically Jewish humor. Then turn to John, read the dialogue, that with the Sumerian woman as the uh, at the well, or that which follows the healing of the man born blind. 
look at his pictures jesus if i may use the word uh bodling with his finger in the dust the un unforgettable unforgettable I have been reading poems, romances, vision literature, legend, myth all my life. I know what they are like. I know that not one of them is like this. Of this text, there are only two possible views. Either this is a um, reportage, though it may no doubt contain errors, pretty close up to the facts, ne uh, nearly as close as Boswell, or else some unknown writer in the second century without known pre, uh, predecessors or successors suddenly anticipated that the whole technique of modern novelistic realistic narrative if it is untrue it must be narrative of that kind the reader who doesn't see this has simply not learned to read i would recommend him to read or botch here from Boltan's theory of the New Testament page 30 is another observe in what unsimulated fashion the prediction of the paros mark 838 follows upon the predictions of the passion 831 what can he mean unassimilated Boltan believes that uh, predictions of the parousia are older than those of the passion. He therefore wants to believe, and no doubt does he be does believe, that when they occur in the same passage from um, discrepancy or unassimilation must be pre precipitable between them. But surely he foists this on the text with shocking lack of perception. Peter has confessed Jesus to be the anointed one. That flash, uh, flash of glory is hardly over between the dark prophecy begins. Over before the dark prophecy begins. That the Son of Man must suffer and die. Then this contrast is repeated. Peter raised for a moment by his confession makes his false false step the cushing rebuff get thee behind me follow follows then across that momentary ruin which peter as so often becomes the voice of the master turning to the crowd generalizes the moral all this fault all his followers must take up the cross this avoidance of suffering this self-preservation is not what life is really about then more def definitely still the summons to martyrdom you must stand to your tackling if you dis disown christ here and now he will disown you later logically emotionally imaginatively the sequence is perfect only a Baltan could think otherwise. Finally, from the same Baltman, the personality of Jesus has no importance for the Kigman either of Paul or of John. Indeed, the tradition of the earliest church did not even unconsciously preserve a picture of his personality. Every attempt to reconstruct one remains a play of subjective imagination. So there is no personality of our Lord presented in the New Testament. Though what strange process has this learned German gone in order to make himself blind to what all men except him see? What evidence have we that we, he would recognize a personality if it were there? For it is Balt Baltman contra mundum if anything whatever is common to all believers and even to many unbelievers it is the sense 
that in the gospel they have met a personality. There are characters whom we know to be historical, but of whom we do not feel that we have any personal knowledge. Knowledge by um, acquaintance, such as Alexander, Attila, or William of Orange. There are others who make no claim to historical reality, but whom, nonetheless, we know as we know real people. Falstaff, Uncle Toby, Mr. Pickwick, but there are only three characters who, claiming the first sort of reality, also actually have the second. And surely everyone knows who they are. Plato's Socrates, the Jesus of the Gospels, and Boswell's Johnson. Our acquaintance with them shows itself in a dozen ways. When we look into the apocalypse, apocryphal gospel we find ourselves constantly saying of this or that religion no it's a fine saying but not his that wasn't how he talked just as we do with all pseudo johnsonia we are not in the least per perturbed by the contrast which uh, within each character, the union in Socrates of silly, silly and scabrous titters about Greek uh, pedestry with the highest mythical fervor and the homeliest good sense in Johnson of profound gravity and melancholy with that love of fun and nonsense which Boswell never understood though Fanny Burry did. In Jesus of peasant shrewdness, intolerable severity, and irresistible tenderness, so strong is the flavor of the personality that, even while he says th things which, on any assumption than that of divine incarnation, is the fullest sense, in the fullest sense, would be appallingly arrogant, yet we and many unbelievers too accept him as his own valuation when he says quote, i am meek and lowly of heart end quote. when those passages in the new testament with superficially which superficially and in intention are most concerned with the divine and least with the human nature bring us face to face with the personality I am not sure that they don't do this more than any other, any others. We believe his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of graciousness and reality, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled. That was in quotes. Which is gained by trying to evade or dissipate this shattering uh, in immediacy of personal contact by talk about quote that significant which the early church found significance which the early church found that it was impelled to attribute to the master master end quote this hits us in the face not what they were impelled to do but what impelled them I begin to fear that by personality, Dr. Baltman means what he should call impersonality. What you'd get in a dictionary of national biography, articles, or an obituary, or a Victorian life and letter of Yeshua Bar Yosef in three volumes with photographs.